and welcome to another review vlog footage combo video. Do let me know in the comments if you like this style of video. I've done a couple of these where I've posted a review and I've posted the vlog footage. Um, I will link my Hank Green one for an absolutely remarkable thing up here um, in case you missed that one and you like this style of video because that is also this style of video. So a couple of weeks ago I went to a library event, so it was a free event, uh, with author Laurie Anderson. Now I have to admit that until I heard about this event and began speaking to some of the librarians about this event I hadn't read anything by this author because I hadn't heard an awful lot about her books. I think maybe it's something that is better marketed here than it is in the UK and so growing up I didn't hear about her books because her books were published when I was a teen and so I could have read them as a teen but I didn't because I didn't know about them. Um, so I went to the event um, after I talk about the book that I read you will see the footage of the event. It was wonderful and she was wonderful and thank you so much to Arapo Libraries for hosting because it was just great to discover a new author. A lot of people there were firm favourites of hers um, and a lot of people there were educators as well and she spoke a lot to um, the educators among us in the audience, um, which I thought was a really good thing. She knew that some of her audience was there because they were readers and some of her audience were there because they were educators, which I thought was really, really good. So her first, well, not her first novel, but the first novel that really took off because she has written all sorts of things. If you look into her back catalogue, she's just put out so much, uh, which is great for someone like me that has just discovered her. Um, her first novel is um, Speak. Now I came away from the event and downloaded the audiobook of this one so that I could read it in audiobook form. However, she spoke at the event about this graphic novel here. So what I decided to do was to listen to the audiobook and then reread it in graphic novel form because some of the pages in the graphic novel, well not some of the pages, the pages uh, in the graphic novel are just wonderful and it is a very dark novel and so I love the fact that the graphic novel is in black and white. I just think it was the best choice to be made um, and the graphic novel hasn't actually been out that long. Uh, Speak I think was published in 1993. Um, I believe this is a signed copy. I don't know if she maybe signed it while she was at the event because I did get it at the library where she was at. But yeah, Speak was published in 1993 and then this one came out. Oh, why doesn't it tell me? Where's my little, my little page? Oh, I will find out and leave it in the description box for you. Um, but... Um, yeah, she spoke about it at the event and so I knew I had to get it. And also, <laughs> when the name of the high school was Merriweather High, I was like, oh, okay, that's my name. Um, oh, here we go. This was published this year. Yes. Okay, so, uh, wait, no. Speak was published as a novel in 1999. Maybe something else happened in 1993. It was probably in the video footage. Oh my goodness, this is rambling already. Um, so yeah, so I listened to the audiobook, which I thought was absolutely fantastic, and then reread it as graphic novel form because I'm trying really hard to read more graphic novels. And so was this. This was also absolutely fantastic. And just the illustrations in here, the fact that it is in black and white, it's just awesome. Um, so <clears throat> the one that she shows in the presentation, I really like, and it's near the beginning. Let me find it. Where is it? Oh, there we go. That's the one that she showed us in the presentation that kind of sold me on the fact that I need to read this book and I need to read it in the graphic novel form. But I listened to it on audiobook. This novel is about someone who is a survivor of um, some kind of sexual assault. We don't learn the full details or the full extent of the assault. Well, I mean, I don't know that we ever learn the exact full details, but we know that 
something has happened the person who ha has assaulted our lovely main character um is not named and details are released very slowly throughout the novel given the fact that this is obviously an issues based novel it is about the fact that you know the effect that this attack and this awful thing has happened to her that has happened to her has had on her has you know caused her to be this quiet person and has caused her to have different reactions to everyday things than we might expect or than is the norm um and so aside from the fact that we have this thread of how she's been affected by this attack and this violation um this feels like just a story about somebody else starting at a new high school and how that feels and the way the book is structured as well i think that um that picture the pictures that i've showed you so far kind of shows you um it's structured in the different classes at school so this is one of the classes um so we've got a phys ed chapter and we've got chapters about prom and things like that so it's structured as if it is just any old young adult novel about somebody starting in high school and the effect that that has on them but there is another layer added there is another level because of the fact that this person is so affected by this abuse that she has suffered and this attack that she has suffered and so has different reactions and has um, another level of feeling about all these new things that are happening to her. Um, she has a very, very strong moral sense of right and wrong and um, some very strong opinions which we as readers get to be part of and get to share but her family and her friends don't get to see that because of the trauma that she has suffered. Um, and sometimes that can make life very hard for her because she isn't able to speak up. It's not that she doesn't want to speak up, it's that she is actually unable to speak up. And that shines a light on what post-traumatic stress disorder can look like and how it can look very different to different people and how it affects people differently but no matter what level of violation or abuse or attack has happened there is going to be some sort of post-traumatic stress effect on them whether that is immediate or whether that comes out later in life and so I would really recommend this this novel the graphic novel is fantastic the audiobook is also fantastic i'm sure the original novel is fantastic obviously if you are a survivor then you know care warnings come with this um because you don't have to read it um but if this is something that you want to see more of in young adult fiction and haven't read this one then i definitely recommend this probably a lot of you watching this will have read this one because i'm so late to the party with it but you know i got on board when the graphic novel was released so <laughs> um yeah really recommend it i don't think i've done it justice talking about it but i don't want to give spoilers away and i really want to highlight the fact that it is a survivor story really well told um yeah so i will now share with you the footage from the uh the event at the library because this author was such a powerful speaker um it's just so amazing to listen to even though I hadn't read any of her books and then immediately well sat in the audience and downloaded the audiobook from the library and borrowed the graphic novel from the library so that's what she did for me um yeah I will share that with you now um and then come back to you at the end um Trigger warnings are a big deal. Uh, people are using those more often. I don't love that that phrase though. I prefer the phrase, um, you know, a, 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 con a, mo a moment of concern or care, a care warning, because one of the things that we're all learning um, in, in this generational shift is how much we all have to take care of ourselves and of each other, right? We try to walk in the world in love, 
even when you're really angry about a lot of things. <laughs> so a strange thing happened over the last 20 years. I wrote a bunch of books, right? These are just my, 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 these are my YAs um, and my historicals. I actually started out writing picture books because I had little kids when I, when I started doing that writing. Um, and then my kids got bigger, so my books got older. Um, Speak was my first novel, so uh, this is like, I guess it's all kind of, chrono well, it's not chronological because the, the historical books kind of were in between the, the YAs. Um, anybody who knew me as a child, particularly my teacher, uh, I, I was that kind of a bad combination of a very tall kid, right? So you guys would put me in the back row, we had rows back then. And I have a very, very short attention span, which is frankly my superpower. Um, and I have a very, very vivid imagination. Those three things combined meant that I was always in the back row going, what? I don't know what's going on in the world. We'll borrow a line from Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, the brilliant, brilliant scholar, who came up with the term that books are uh, mirrors into a reader's own experience, windows uh, into the experience of somebody else, or sliding glass doors into another experience completely. I don't write dark books. I write resilience literature. Resilience literature. All right, so how the heck did that happen? Look at me. Look at how excited I am to be in seventh grade. <laughs> I can do it. Anybody can. <laughs> because I, like, I was such an idiot. I have, by the way, gone back and reread all those classics that I didn't read in high school. And it turns out if you're 42 or 50, uh, they're great books. <laughs> Um, but when I was 14 and they handed me Scarlet Letter, like, oh. <laughs> Old Man in the Sea, oh, for heaven's sakes, it's just fishing. <laughs> you know? Um, so um, what I did is, uh, one of the biggest things I did that got me healthy is that I, I left home my senior year. I was a foreign exchange student my senior year. I lived on a pig farm in Denmark. Um, you should all go live on pig farms in Denmark. <laughs> Denmark and, and I'm still very, very close to my family there. It was a sober family, um, so loving, healthy relationships. And I am alive, and I am relatively healthy because of that extraordinary family there. And when I came back to the United States, I was not going to go to college. I told Daddy, because we had a long conversation about this, I said, I don't like school. And college is school you have to pay for. <laughs> We're broke. And he said, um, he handed me a piece of paper that had the math on it, how much I was going to have to pay him every month if I was going to live in his house and not go to school. <laughs> My old man was a drunk, but he was smart. <laughs> right? And so I did, um, I got a job at, at a mall. And that's what convinced me to go to college. <laughs> if you need motivation to go to college, go work in the mall. It's, it's, oh, I was like, I can't do this the rest of my life. So the second thing that helped me, it really shaped me as a human being, and I'm so grateful for their influence, is I went to Onondaga Community College in Syracuse, New York. And by that point, Daddy actually, the church let him back in, because he sort of did some growing. And we moved out to the country. So to pay for college, I was milking cows. Um, and shoveling cow manure at 3.30 in the morning and 3.30 in the afternoon. And when I would go to the clubs, because it was I was that age, right? It was kind of cute, right? Didn't have this. And it didn't matter how much I scrub my fingernails. I'd be dancing, right? Come and come, oh, he looks good. And he'd get too close and he'd get a whiff of cow manure. <laughs> and I knew that really convinced me I needed to get an education. <laughs> I just wanted a date. <laughs> Funny the thing, the choices that you made. But in turn, I did. I was working so hard at this farm to pay for community college. Instead of sitting in the back row like I used to and daydreaming and not paying attention, I was always sat in the front row. Right? I became that that girl. Right? Because I was always asking questions if I didn't understand something. Because I had been up since 3:30 in the morning, shoveling what came out the back end of a cow. Right? <laughs> So I paid attention, did my homework, showed up to every class and asked when I had questions and a surprising thing happens when you do that. I got great grades. I come at it kind of from a more instinctual level of story. Um, I still don't know what a theme is. If anybody wants to enlighten me, see me later. <laughs> I had always been that kid after I learned how to write who turned to writing as a way to make sense of the world. Um, and so that continued in my adult life. So I decided that I wanted to try to write books. I had little kids at this point. I was a journalist for a long time. 
And when I sat down to write books, um, I was arrogant and ignorant. I made every single mistake. If you have rejections, come talk to me. Because <laughs> I have hundreds of them. Hundreds of rejections when I started to write because I was the idiot who had not paid attention in English class. <laughs> and I was arrogant, right? Oh, such a bad combination. So I would get these great ideas. And I was mostly writing picture books at this point, right, for little kids. I would get these great ideas. And I would write them down. Picture books have like 500 to 700 words. And I would check it for spelling because I know that's important. <laughs> and I would send it off to New York City and wait. And months later, it would come back. And it was rejected. Most of these are form rejections, which is a polite way of saying, lady, you suck. <laughs> but they say it in like grown-up New York City language. Um, uh, then I, I, I realized that maybe I should do this thing that my English teachers always hinted about called revision. <laughs> right? Revision. It turns out you guys are smart, right? <coughs> you know what you're talking about. And so when I started to finally revise my work, um, it got better. I published a couple of picture books. Uh, does anybody here know my historical novel, Fever 1793? Yes! Right? My history nerds in the audience. I actually started work, working on that in 1993 because there was a 200 year anniversary of that epidemic in Philly. And oh, that book was so bad. So bad. Everybody turned it down. And I had been working on it for years and I put it aside because I didn't know how to make it better. I had a very bad dream one. So when I had a nightmare late in 1996 and I, I was a girl sobbing, I woke up and I actually thought it was Stephanie. So I went down and checked on her. I was like, oh, guilty mom. And she was fine. She wasn't crying that night. Um, but does this happen to anybody in here? When I fell back asleep, I fell right back into that nightmare. Right? It's recurring, right? Ah! Yeah. So what I, what I know about that, at least the way my brain works, is that when I'm having a recurring or a, a nightmare that keeps on picking up, it's usually my subconscious going, hey, hey you. Something's going on you need to be paying attention to, right? And the way I deal with that is I, I write. So that night I turned on my computer and I just did a, a, a stream of consciousness drained up about this crying girl in my head. I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what. I didn't know why she was crying. I didn't know what had happened, but I kind of had a character in my head. Um, obviously Melinda's personality is fairly close to mine. Um, but her journey in speak is definitely my emotional journey. But I had to think, I didn't want to, I didn't want to talk about my own experience, which is why I wanted to fictionalize and she developed into a completely new person. So what I started that night turned out to be speak. It took me about two weeks and I was like, oh, I know why she's crying, right? And uh, that was amazing. I had a full-time job and was a mom when I was working on this book. So this, for those of you who are writers in the room, the speak was mostly written between 4 and 6 in the morning. Um, and I gave up television. That's sort of, I haven't really, have really gone back to it. Because you have to give up something if you're going to find the time to be creative. There were no expectations for this book. The first person I sent it to rejected it. So next time you get a rejection letter, say to yourself, somebody rejected speak. That was stupid. <laughs> right? Um, that first rejection letter, I laminated <laughs> later. Yes, and if I'm having a bad day, I pull it out and I laugh, <laughs> right? Bitterness will take you far. <laughs> um, the second person I sent it to was interested in it, but asked me to do a revision called on spec, meaning that they won't um, promise you anything. There's no contract, there's no money, but, you know, let's see what you're made of. It's kind of like an audition. When the book was finally published, because I did figure it out, my editor said, now listen, lady, don't get your hopes up book might sell, well, here's our hopes, we're hoping it's going to sell 3,000 copies in three years. I said, geez, you know, there's a lot of teenagers, big country, millions of people. This is back in, this was in 98, the book came out in 99. And she said, oh, teenagers don't read. And I said, why are you publishing the book? And she said, quote, teachers and librarians will read anything. <laughs> Happy to report that she left publishing shortly after that, right? 1999 was a seminal, groundbreaking year in, in young adult literature. It was, we, we just hit a, just dumb luck, right? We had this, this bulge of the population, um, kind of baby boomers 2.0, 
<coughs> we call them millennials now. And then um, a lot of books got written and published that year, like Walter Dean Meyer's Monster, that really spoke to the concerns of kids who hadn't found themselves in books before. So Speak has published, has uh, uh, sold almost five million copies very much and helped me put all my children through college. <laughs> Nobody had to work on a farm. Um, and it's changed my life. Um, not just the writing of the book, obviously that would have been fine, that would have been more than enough, even if it had never been published. But the opportunity to travel not only the country but the world and listen to the experiences of others. Not everybody has been a victim of sexual violence, thank goodness, but so many people get to their adolescence and something bad happens, right? Because bad things happen to good people all the time. And if they don't have a really robust network of adults who can see that something's going on, not necessarily even parents, right, but just, we need a village, everybody needs a village. Um, sometimes those scars linger long into adulthood. Um, I, I know a lot of adults who are struggling with a lot of pain. And when you get to know them a little bit and you talk to them, you realize that that pain often has its roots in their adolescence or childhood. Um, this is why you guys like to read this because this helps. We all are 15 when we're reading about a 15. Um, so, uh, and it is just, I've learned so much about life and the world from listening to the stories of readers. I just can't get over how stinking lucky I am. They made a movie version of Speak in 2003. Kristen Stewart was the lead actress. This is before she was in Twilight. <clears throat> I have opinions about that. <laughs> she did a phenomenal job. She was only 13 years old when we shot this film. So this is a very, very low budget movie um, made for television. Uh, what's most important, more important than Kristen is that I'm in the movie. Yes, yes, my one big break. I got to play the lunch lady with mashed potatoes <laughs> for like 0. 0.3 seconds. <laughs> and I came away from the film with so much more respect for lunch ladies right? and actors, because it's way harder. Um, watching them, I was on set for a couple days with my oldest kid, and just watching how they made a film, right? What do I know from that? Changed the way I write for teenagers. Because I realized that my generation came to story like we had three channels, black and white, when I was a kid, right? We all were outside. Um, coming, I came. My generation came to story through text, and so from a very young age, we were used to reading long blocks of text, you know, 10, 20 page chapters. Um, starting with my, so I, my first kid was born in '85. I say even before that, <coughs> starting with kids born in the early '80s. Kids started coming to story first through visuals, screen time, more cable television, uh, and then computers, and now everything, everything is, which is actually much more natural. Reading is not a natural thing, right? It's encoding and decoding uh, symbols on a page. Um, but watching how they took my narrative subtext from the story and turned and visualized it, um, which is kind of the same thing we do when we dramatize. Um, emotional states, right? And when, when we're writing, I realize that in every scene I ever write, I need to ground my reader enough so that the reader can picture that world easily. Um, and so, in terms of my own revision process, when I'm working sort of in, late in the revision process, that's one of the things that I double check is to make sure that I've given you the details that you can not see that space, but you can feel that space, you can smell it. Um, so, that was a really good learning process for me. Um, in 2011, I'm doing my time, ooh, talk faster, girl. In 2011, I went to my publisher and I said, so the kids these days, they like those graphic novel things. I had to look up what a graphic novel was. <laughs> but I did that before I went into the meeting. Um, I said, why don't we do a, the, a speak and turn that into a graphic novel? And they were, they were down with that. So we hired Emily Carroll, um, who's a very talented artist from Canada. Uh, I hired, I, she was at the top of my list because she, she is known for drawing horror comics. And this is a book about horror. Anybody who's been through this experience, um, and especially if you don't get the support that you need. Um, and best of all, because Emily is Canadian, she had never heard the book. So she came to it fresh. So in 2015, <coughs> I started working on the script for the book. Um, and what I love hearing from teachers all over the country is that a kid will read the graphic novel love it, really get into it, totally dig it. 
and then go to the teacher and say, can I read the book book now? And they're all using this little phrase, book book, because they want to go back into that experience and now they're ready for it. Um, so I'm just so honored to be a, a piece of this. I really love working on the graphic novel version. T, you see what I mean? Um, so yeah, thanks again to Arapaho Libraries for hosting and to Laurie Hall Sanderson for visiting. Um, it was such a great event and I'm so pleased that I have now read Speak and am able to share it with all of you. Um, if you enjoyed this video, please give a thumbs up. Let me know what Laurie Hall Sanderson novel I should read next in the comments below or if you are new to it, what you might be picking up. Um, make sure you subscribe so that my next video lands in your subscription feed and I will be back with another video very soon. Bye!